Hello everyone, this is my first time to preach using uh, YouTube and I hope it goes well. Let me explain while I am not with you in person there in Moose Pass today and the neck brace I have on here. On Monday, uh, my wife Heather and I were doing some work remodeling a bathroom. We replaced a boiler about three years ago and our new boiler has a side vent rather than going through the roof. Uh, in, in remodeling the, the new the, the bathroom, we removed the old bulkhead where the old stack went through the roof and um, the stack was, the, the metal part of it was still sticking down into the bathroom. And so I went up to uh, work on uh, trimming that so it wouldn't get in the way of drywalling. I got that done and on my, uh, by the way, I'm very paranoid about ladders. I'm 50 years old, never fallen off one yet. And I've been on ladders a lot. I was a little paranoid because it was a little slick that day, so I worked hard to be sure the ladder was stable. I'm sure it was fine. Um, after I trimmed the metal piece and got it all fixed back, I was walking back over to come back down. I remember stepping on the top rung of the ladder, or not the top rung, but stepping onto the ladder. I had it where I wouldn't get overbalanced, or at least I thought I wouldn't. And that's the last thing I remember until I was on the came to on the deck in extreme pain. Apparently, I knocked myself unconscious for a while, and um, Heather was inside running a sander, so she didn't hear didn't hear me fall. And um, I drugged myself inside. She took me to the emergency room and did an X-ray. I broke my C7 vertebrae. I'm not in danger of paralysis, however, but it is quite painful and then I just I'm just bruised up a bunch I've got big bruises all over my back I'm thankful that I'm still alive and talking to you today and also thankful that I'm not paralyzed that could have happened very easily so I thank God for both of those things I'll have to be in this collar for six weeks but that also means I can't drive and so unless someone gives me a ride to Moose Pass I anticipate I won't be there for a while I committed to preach today and we didn't have a, a fill-in in time and so this is the uh, solution we came up with. Um, the last time I was with you I talked about blessing those who curse you and today I want to move on in talking about um, how do we go through or how do we give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to help us with that inward transformation in us and uh, I have an outline for you um, and so you want to take a look at that, follow along if you will, and then I have some uh, small group discussion questions for you to look at after the sermon is over with today. Remember during potluck time you can talk about those with each other. All right, I'm just getting my stuff ready here. So the theme we're looking at today that you'll see on your outline is how do we renew the mind when it has been ruined by sin? Years ago, I had uh, a car that broke down a lot, and uh, a really honest mechanic, thank the Lord. And uh, we were struggling seminary students, didn't have much money. This guy was in Fort Worth, Texas. His name is Ken Elam. Actually, your pastor knows Ken, took the cars to him as well. One day I was there, and there was a Mustang there that had been uh, trashed by weathering. It looked like it had been left outside for a long time. It was um, rusty, um, the rag top was worn out, and I asked him about it, it was sitting over in the corner of his shop, and he said, yeah, an older woman brought it in, and she said that um, it was her husband's, and he had died, had been sitting outside, and she decided she wanted it put back together. She said, I want to remember my husband, because he loved this car, and she told uh, Ken, the mechanic, Money is no object. I want you to restore it to exactly the way it was when it rolled off the showroom floor down to stickers in the engine compartment. And because my car broke down a lot over the, the weeks, I got to bring it back a couple of times and get to see the car in various uh, phases of restoration. I happened to be there just before they gave it back to the woman. And Ken was very proud to show it to me and to show him, me all the work that they had done it was beautiful. If anything, it was probably better than it was 
when it rolled off the showroom floor. He talked about doing all the research to find all the original stickers and to get all original parts when they could to put this thing back together. And it was absolutely beautiful. Well, like a ruined car, our minds have been ruined or corrupted by sin, and they require a renewal. How do we go about that? We find insight into that process in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Um, so first I want to look at a wholehearted commitment that's called for in Scripture. And this is in Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So Paul says here, in view of God's mercy, we should offer our bodies uh, that if we have received uh, Christ as personal Savior, we have experienced God's mercy. And, and offering our bodies, the image he is alluding to here is the burnt offerings in Leviticus 1, um, 3 through 17. Um, and, and it's actually offered as an, as an expression of one's devotion to God. In the, case, in the case of a person um, would, would bring an offering, it was either an animal or a bird, to the priest, and the sacrifice was completely burned on the altar. It was an offering to the Lord. Um, the priest got no portion like he did with other offerings, and so it is called the Holocaust offering. Holo means whole, and cost means burnt so we are to dedicate our physical bodies to the Lord in his service and Paul says that it is our spiritual act of worship it it's an act of sincere inner spirit directed service to God and that commitment involves of course our mind our heart and our will as well Isaac Watts, uh, hymn writer, uh, says in, in, this, in his hymn, But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Phil Johnson says we are simply kidding ourselves if we are trying to do Christian things and yet have never fully pledged ourselves to Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's really true. Um, but here's the rub, and here's the problem that many people have, and that is the world desires to have us. Uh, it, uh, our society tries to conform us to it as part of the world. It's under the power of the devil. And um, Paul says, uh, let's look first of all at 12.2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The Greek word translated conform means to be pressed into a mold. It's the, uh, it's the process by which that molding happens. Um, there's a Russian educational psychologist whose name is Lev Vygotsky. And he talks about the internalization of culture. And he says, uh, he names it, he calls it sociogenesis. And he says that the way we absorb our culture depends on mental tools. And he says, um, human beings have the capability of using things like advanced spoken and written language that the animal kingdom does not have. That's what separates us from them. Um, Language is a major mental tool that, that we use, spoken and written, but there's also math and um, art that would also fit into that category, and music that we use to communicate with each other. All those are mental tools, but mainly language. And he says the way we absorb our culture, it depends on the people who are closest to us. That is, our parents, our siblings, our teachers, our, our friends, and he wrote in the 1920s. Now we would even add the media. And he says this process begins from infancy as people begin to speak to us. And later we have a conversation with people. Um, so it begins with having the most basic thoughts. 
And um, then as, as we have uh, thoughts and we interact with our surroundings, um, those all come together to form concepts. And, and concepts are collections of thoughts and impression that, that define the most basic parts of our lives. Things like uh, freedom or, or the American dream or the home or what it means to be feminine or masculine. All of those are concepts that are made up of thoughts. And if you put a bunch of concepts together, we come up with even a more um, global thing that we call images. And images are also a large part of the landscape of life. Um, now, if you have a, a, an Apple product, like an iPhone, hold it up. I want to see it. I, I don't have my iPad here close by me. Um, but hold it up. What you see on your Apple, on your iPhone, or your iPad, or even a MacBook, is the Apple logo. And um, another is is uh, the um, the Windows logo if you're, if you're a PC user, or if you go to McDonald's, the golden arches. Um, those images are powerful. When we see them, uh, well, the, the iPhones have become a, a status symbol. Little children certainly know the golden arches, and the, the marketers at uh, McDonald's are geniuses because. You know, when kids see those, they want to go get the Happy Meal. And my kids never liked food all that much. They just wanted the toy. But advertisers pay millions of dollars on ads that only last a few seconds because they realize the power of images. Now, I have an image of myself. You have an image of yourself. And the, the image that, that we have of ourselves is more complicated than a simple icon like the McDonald's symbol. Um, it may have been formed by ab abuse or neglect in childhood or, or some other phase of life. But the image I have of myself, the image you have of yourself, holds powerful sway over our thoughts and actions. And we are saturated with thoughts, concepts, and images of a fallen world. Now, and the the process of eternalizing these things leads to the whole way we view the world, and they are a powerful force for evil. And then there's peer pressure. We need to belong, to find acceptance. And that is the engine that presses people into a common worldview. Believe me, the world desires to have you. Um, but then there is... You know, I, I look at my life before I became a follower of Christ and the way that I was so subject to peer pressure, and everyone is. I mean, I'm even sub to, uh, subject to it now to a certain extent. But after conversion, Paul talks about this in, in 113. He says, he's talking about uh, Jesus here, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. And to that I say, Praise God. But even after conversion, the transformation process can be a gut-wrenching thing. And sometimes God brings to our attention matters that we don't want to look at, that, that are uncomfortable. Uh, years ago, um, led a man to Christ. Actually, his whole family came to Christ. And uh, he had been an IV drug user. God miraculously saved him. He'd actually been sober for a couple of years when he came to the Lord, um, but um, he had just done everything you can imagine, and probably then some, and he and his wife had had a rocky relationship, and he called me one day, and he said, I can't even have fun getting angry and screaming insults at my wife anymore, because the Holy Spirit convicts me of what I've done now, of my sin. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny, um, but I think his experience highlights um, the, the experience of all of us who know Christ, that is, after conversion, we begin to experience the struggle between the old and the new nature. And for most of us, the old nature is probably strongly related to the culture in which we were brought up. Um, you know, there's a, 
you can make overgeneralizations, but I think there's a, a character of the popular Western worldview today that has sustained, um, maybe from the early part of the 1900s and, and even until now, and Ernest Hemingway gives us some insights into that. In Paris, A Movable Feast, he reflects on life in the city of Paris in the Roaring Twenties. And he calls it my one and only life. My one and only life. Like, this is it. <clears throat> when I die, I'm dead and I take a dirt nap. Um, and even the title of his novel, The Sun Also Rises, reflects this idea. Uh, it's like, well, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, that's, and that's all that there is. And uh, Sorry, I bonked the microphone there. Solomon, from, uh, I think, a more sarcastic point of view, says in Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 10, um, and, and now remember that Solomon's coming to a, a godly conclusion in Ecclesiastes, but in the process of that, he gives a very uh, sarcastic, pessimistic view of life. He says, Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of the meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. Now that's a pretty hopeless worldview. If, if reality, if all that there is, is confined to the physical world, and there's nothing beyond that, then I don't understand how people make it, what kind of hope they have, if they truly believe the physical world is all that there is. In addition to this, with a worldview in place that we've talked about, um, and then an image that we have of ourselves that created the fallen world, our minds and our bodies are programmed for evil. And the devil can take a vacation. And it takes supernatural power to come against that kind of stronghold. Which brings us to the next point, which is renewing the mind. And this is in Romans 12, verse 2. This is the second part of that verse. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So against this fortress of darkened thinking, things like psychology seem impotent. Uh, take the power of just images. Um, and this is just one example. Young boys who are exposed to images of wealthy musicians promoting a life of opposing the law and drug use. Uh, they, they, they grew up in poor neighborhoods a lot of times. And, and you hear it over and over again. I, you know, I was living a, a normal life there in my, in my home. My, my family didn't have much money. And I saw the guys who had all the fancy cars and the money and the women were the drug dealers. And the people who were um, involved in the hip-hop culture and so I decided to do that myself. Um, and for young men who've been saturated in this form of, of, of lifestyle and, and the rap music that goes along with it, the gangster rap and the culture, removing those things from their minds is impossible. And even after they come to Christ as new believers, they struggle with still desiring the wicked things promoted by rap and hip-hop culture. The good news is, is there's hope. And, and here's the thing, we can't transform our thought processes by direct effort, but we can adopt certain practices that indirectly will, will have that effect. Um, there's a, a, a man and, and his little boy, a little three-year-old boy, went out to play in the first snow of the year. And um, the little boy jumped and played his three-year-old's will. And, the, and he tried to open his mouth and catch the snowflakes. And he watched the snow fall on his coat. And, and he, as he watched the, fall, the snow fall on his coat, he told his dad, uh, Daddy, when the snow falls on my coat, it looks like little crumbs. Well, after a while, they got cold. And they went inside. And uh, they got warm. And later they went to bed. And the next morning, they got up. And they found that their little town had actually ground to a stop 
because the little seemingly inconsequential crumbs, the little crumbs, had accumulated minute by minute, hour by hour, and they had grown into four feet of snow with even bigger drifts. And even huge trucks couldn't move in the snow. Well, so it is with the spiritual life. Um, those choices we make every day, those seemingly inconsequential choices, have a profound influence on our lives for good or evil. Now, how many times have you heard, um, or, or how many times have I said, actually, it makes no difference what music I listen to, or the movies or TV shows I watch, or the internet sites I frequent. It doesn't have any influence over how I behave. It doesn't make a difference. But all those things do, in fact, have a cumulative influence um, for good or evil. And the good news is that we can take definite steps to redeem the thoughts and images that are before us and we can choose to avoid those things that would feed a view of the world that is ruined by evil. One of the things we can do, uh, just an everyday action, is to make Scripture part of our lives. That includes Bible study. It includes uh, memorizing Scripture, such as this passage in Romans chapter 12, and making them a permanent part of the landscape of our thoughts. And when we go through life experiences, we will have them at hand. We should also keep before us uh, sayings, poetry, songs, and visual art that have the effect of directing us toward God, uh, toward the church, toward the people of God. Uh, my grandmother, when I was growing up, when I was a little boy, uh, actually practiced this. And she had a little, several plaques of Bible verses and that kind of thing in her house. But I remember one in particular. It said, Fear knocked at the door faith answered no one was there those kind of things ought to be placed so that they will be before our vision in our homes uh, music is also such a powerful force we need to consider the kind of music we listen to and whether it is edifying or not uh, in other words does it create destructive imagery or does it create imagery that directs us to God? And then I think it's also uh, important to, to seek out others who are seeking to renew their minds. And one of the ways we can do this is by reading biographies of uh, great godly people like George Mueller or Amy Carmichael or Martin Luther or Jim Elliott. Uh, these are people who authentically practice the Christian faith. And... Uh, they give us a vision of what our lives might be like as we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. And finally, verse 2 says that as we are transformed, we can discern what God wants from us. Paul reminds us his will is a good. That is, it leads to our spiritual and our moral growth. And it is pleasing to him. Now, that all may seem like a great deal to ask, but God asks us, in the words of Sam Shoemaker, the old uh, pastor from a few years ago, to give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus Christ as I know. That's what Jesus wants of us, and uh, that's what I pray for you. Uh, let's, let's have a, a closing prayer. And uh, then I assume we'll have um, some uh, final music. And don't forget to consider those uh, small group questions. I want you to talk about them in groups of three or four, maybe uh, while you eat or maybe after you eat. And uh, go along with the sermon to help you think about these things some more. Because transforming, allowing God the opportunity to transform us from the inside out is such an important thing. And it begins with choices we make every day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for a time to look at your word today and to consider how we might transform our lives from the inside out. Um, Lord, um, I pray for each person here and the struggles they're having. Lord, only you know what those struggles are. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would give them grace for each moment, for each day. And we pray, Lord, that each member of this congregation will become more like you, little by little, the way that you have designed the process. So, Lord, help us to be faithful uh, to do the things uh, that give you an opportunity to transform us from the inside out. And Lord, I thank you and praise you that I'm still able to be here um, teaching and preaching. I'm still able to speak, that I'm not paralyzed, and uh, that, in fact, the church is not announcing my funeral. And um, just thank you for the opportunity to be able um, to teach today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, we're going to have a time of invitation now, and uh, we'll come back in a few minutes.